Hello and welcome to the Connecticut Cannabis Chamber of Commerce. Today's roundtable focuses on the realities of real estate in Connecticut's cannabis industry. My name is Adam Wood and I'm the president and co-founder of the Connecticut Cannabis Chamber of Commerce. I hope you'll log on to our website and learn more about our organization at ctcannabischamber.org. When it comes to real estate in this new industry, things get very complicated very quickly. Purchasing, leasing, and construction bring with them a host of considerations and concerns, not the least of which are local zoning regulation and how to, how to navigate local government. We hope to clear up some of these issues with today's panel of experts. Deanna Rhodes is a certified planner and director of planning and neighborhood services department for the city of Norwich. She has over 30 years in land use and development field, developing deep experience and know-how in all aspects of community planning and zoning. Mark Oaken works for the North Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters as council representative. An apprentice and journeyman carpenter for over 20 years, he currently covers a region that encompasses Tallinn, Hartford, and Litchfield counties, as well as representing workers at more than a dozen industrial sites across the state. Skip Lane works with Cushman and Wakefield as director of their leasing services group. He's an energetic and knowledgeable commercial broker with over 27 years of experience. Over the years, Mr. Lane has represented a wide range of office and retail and clients, including Walmart, Best Buy, Guinness North America, and many more. Mr. Lane is also a former professional football player um, with the New York Jets and six other professional teams. Thanks for joining us today, and thanks to our members who sent in questions for this forum. Let's get things underway. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I wanted to kick off the, today's forum by asking each of you sort of what your experience has been like to date. It's, you know, it's an exciting time to be in Connecticut in the industry and just wanted to sort of kick it off to each of you to describe what your uh, experience has been like to date um, in real estate and, and uh, uh, with the cannabis industry. So Norwich has been just really embraced this industry. Um, we think that it's going to be a good match in our community. So um, we have had our doors open and have had several forums. We've invited people to, to learn about Norwich and what we're doing here. And um, so it's been exciting. I've been working really closely with our, uh, our economic development partner, which is Norwich Community Development Corporation, and our own utility company, which is Norwich Public Utilities who are um, both really on board um, with the cannabis industry and trying to promote um, having a production facility here and a retail facility as well. So um, we're excited and, and the people we've met so far have been really professional and um, just really engaging and excited about being part of the industry. So it's, it's been really, it's been really wonderful so far. We have had a really positive experience. Skip, how about um, you? Yeah, I, I wish I had such an experience. And uh, that's great. And, I, and it's, I don't know how to say it, but I think it's lower Fairfield County. I think the wealthier the town, the, the kind of the more difficult the zoning boards are. And it's a breath of fresh air to hear Deanna say, I don't think you'd hear that come out of Greenwich or Westport. Um, it's great to hear. And, it, and it's been embraced by the federal government. And these towns have kind of put up the stone wall and you know, not in my backyard, not in my community, which I, I you know, it's just, they're just going to be another retailer, like a liquor store. I don't understand the, the, the pushback, but it's been frustrating from a broker to try to service the, the client because most of the communities down here are, are not going to allow the use. So then you have to go to the ones that are, and the ones that are, are kind of steering the tenant, which, you know, almost feels like it's, some kind of against some type of antitrust rules to me that they can tell you where to go with this because it creates an extortion kind of environment with it with a landlord if i'm the landlord and, and you get pushed into my one of four addresses and i own one of them obviously if i have a 25 dollar building i'm going to tell you i want 50 dollars a foot so it really puts the tenant and everybody in a difficult situation and it seems like the more sophisticated the landlord the more they you know they want percentage lease clauses they want a part of you know and, and then the tenant of course says i have enough partners i don't want a partner so they've just it's just it, the way they've done this the way they've rolled it out doesn't seem like it's very efficient to me thanks skip uh mark how about you on the construction side well from the construction of things we we enjoy building stuff so anything from a uh, a retail building to a 40 million dollar cultivation facility that's going up right now we we love building stuff and um you know the industry itself presents a new opportunity to build things correctly um actually our our industry or our, our my organization has created a program to work in existing facilities for training to uh 
take care of any contaminants and making sure nothing, uh, no mold is generated or spores and make sure everything's contained so that people are getting the best product uh, possible. So we're taking it very seriously and looking at it across the entire country and taking opportunities to build the best buildings that we can possibly build. So our first question today, um, I'm going to point to uh, Deanna, um, and uh, it is, um, what are some of the basic requirements that people need to know about with respect to real estate um, in terms of the application process and licensing? So I would say the first thing, you got to start at looking properties that are in the right zones for what you're looking for. So figure out what the community has decided of where, if they're going to allow it and where they're going to allow it, and really focus your efforts in those areas for zoning. I would work closely with your planning, um, planning or planner in the community or a zoning official. We are lucky to have Norwich Community Development Corporation, which is our economic development arm of the city. So we work really closely together and have pretty much um, determined where these um, best properties would be. Um, not trying to steer anybody, particularly like Skip was saying, but really kind of try, in our case to try to assist them of, of you know, a wild goose chase trying to find properties. So we've kind of narrowed it down. We have created a map where those DIA areas are um, mm -hmm. to make it easy for people to see. It shows where the opportunity zones are in our city, where um, and, and enterprise zones are, all those financial things that really help to, to get someone interested. So I would say look at zoning, look at all those other layers, like I said, all those financial layers, those opportunity zones. Look at this particular sites, look at what the parking is there. Is it going to really be sufficient? Look at the utilities. How is it hooked up to, um, is it on sewer water? Is there um, the power that you need, especially if it's a production manufacturing type facility? Um, what's the traffic flow going to be like? Do you think it's going to be an issue on um, the type of roads that it is? Is it more of a state road? Is it a small um, rural road? So look at all those kind of things. Um, and again, in our particular community, um, we're here to assist you. So if you find something, you call you know call us up, and you can you know make kind of guide you of those kind of to answer those questions. And, um, and I'll touch on it later on, I'm sure, but you know, looking at the properties and seeing what kind of, is there potential, are, are they in a flood hazard area? Are they a brownfields? And how can we tell you that right away? So when you're looking at a property, um, you already know, you know, maybe there's gonna be some increased costs that, you know, Mark would have to, you know, he was helping with um, building out a space that he'd have to now think about too, to assist you with. So, um, but as far as those are the basic things, it's just really finding, are the right properties and don't you know waste your time chasing um, properties that just aren't going to work in that community. Um, our next question um, is for uh, for Skip, and um, the question is, um, what do we need to get started? So I'm you know I've got a business, I know I'm going to put in an application. Um, what is the first thing um, I need to do? What's the best first step I should take, Skip? Well, everybody should hire a good commercial real estate broker like me. You know, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> no, but in all, in all honesty, you should hire a commercial real estate broker and a zoning expert, or at least have one on your uh, Rolodex that you can, once you get to that level, that you can help them expedite your, the zoning process because they know, you know, their ins and outs of, of, the, of the zoning codes. And, um, and how, do you you find, how do you find one of those, Skip? Would you do like Google a zoning yeah. Lawyer I, I, in, yeah, in. I know I know most of them down here, but yeah, you Google it in the town. And it's like an econ economic development can probably help you. The zoning office can probably help you. And most of the zoning offices are pretty are open to you know walk-ins nowadays, and they're friendly about you. Just go in there with your with your questions, and they're usually pretty helpful. Great. Um, so my next question is um, sort of about the timeline for permits. So Deanna, what are the timeframes people need to be aware of um, for approval of permits? Um, and are you aware of any permits that have been approved yet? Um, and how has that process gone so far? Oh, so in our community, no permits have been issued or anything like that. Um, but for timeframes, it really depends on the site that you're looking at. So if you find a site that in our particular case, we, if you find a site that's in a manufacturing zone, um, it has previously been manufacturing, it can be fairly simple. It could likely be a zoning permit. So a really quick turnaround matter of weeks. I mean, it could be, you know, days and weeks, really, really short time, time frame. However, in other zones where we allow it um, might be a site plan use or a special permit use, which um, statutory takes longer, you know, so a special permit is a public hearing. So usually, you know, you advertise that a lot of communities have notice requirements to a butters or a sign. Um, so you know, you kind of have to plan on a couple months, I would say at least two months to get through a special permit process. Site plan may be um, shorter, maybe a month to two, but you need to build that in if you're looking for a location that falls under the zoning regulations of the site plan or special permit use. What I like to guide people towards, if you want the simplest thing is find a building that was previously from a manufacturing standpoint, 
find um, a building that was used previously for manufacturing in our community, that's a slam dunk. You know, it's going to be really easy to get that approval. Um, if you're looking for a retail location um, in the city of Norwich, what we've decided is we're going to um, treat them the same as we treat a, a liquor establishment. So there's a separation distance between them of 1,500 feet. And right now, I, I believe our city will only receive, um, will only have one retail establishment. Um, so it's not going to be an issue, but in the future, we're hoping that, you know, if those more licenses are given out, there'd be uh, more opportunities for our retailers. However, those separation distance, again, we're going to treat it just like liquor, so it'd be 1,500 feet from each other at this point. So we wouldn't stack them and um, in the community, so you don't have like this one area, which is where all the people who are buying liquor are hanging out at. We're trying to, you know, to, to be fair to the community and balance it out where they're at. So we'd be looking at commercial zones for something like that. You'd be looking not in a residential zone, not an industrial zone in our community. We're looking at um, our typical locations where you'd have retail restaurants and, and uh, those kind of uses. So um, fairly easy again. Um, so time frame for approving a retail permit. Um, if it's a retail location in a commercial zone, it's probably gonna be a zoning permit unless it's a brand new facility that's being built. And maybe that would end up triggering it to go into a border commission. But if you find an existing location for retail, um, it, it will be a really quick turnaround. So great, thank you. So I've got my, uh, I've got, I figured out what part of the city I want to be in and what city I want to be in. I've, I've talked to the city zoning folks. I've got a great realtor um, in place and maybe an attorney. Um, what type of building, Mark? What what type of building should I be looking for? What kind of considerations? Um, you know, if I'm lucky, as Deanna mentioned, I I can find a manufacturing. Uh, building so I don't have to deal with additional zoning considerations, but outside of the zoning considerations um, and the best deal, which uh, Skip could help me get, um, wh what do I need to be thinking about? What should I be thinking about as a first time person? What qualities or characteristics should the building or the property have um, that would be the best um, or most advantageous for me? First and foremost, you should obviously make sure that the site's not contaminated so you don't have to worry about brownfield. But uh, secondly, is making sure that the building is structurally sound. So there doesn't need to be a lot of structural repair done to it. Third, I would also make sure that the infrastructure of the building, meaning the electrical and, and plumbing, would be ready to take on the burden of supplying electrical uh, electricity for, say, a cultiv cultivation facility. Because right now, the uh, switch gears, it's the equipment you need to change the service for a building, is running between 9 and 18 months from date of order. So say you go through the whole process with Anna and Skip and you get the building purchased and then you finally get your drawings done. Well, once you figure out what you need, then you have another 18 months to wait until your, your equipment's gonna actually be there to start uh, construction. So it takes a lot. And also understanding what the building is made up of. So I would also make sure your engineers that you have brought in, um, look at it and make sure that it can be retrofitted to um, take the uh, vapor pressure that's going to be in that building um, from the water, uh, you know, the, the moisture in the air, you know, basically creating a building that's going to be holding an indoor pool, if you think about it, uh, the amount of vapor pressure that's in there. And if you don't have it done correctly, uh, mold will be growing in different places that you don't know and contaminating your product. Anyone else have uh, thoughts on, uh, you know, considerations for building? I, I concur with what Mark said, um, as far as brownfields, first thing that I would do if I was interested in a building that had previously been, you know, looked like it had been done, had manufacturing there or any kind of industrial use is make sure that there's a phase one that's on the, the building, which is an environmental site assessment, phase one or phase two, where they go a little bit deeper into figuring out what had done there, some uh, happened at that property. Um, they sometimes do some soil sampling. Um, I think it's really helpful. And even if it's not a building that had manufacturing or industrial use, but if it's an older building, it still might have some contaminants. It might have asbestos, lead, those kind of things that, again, this is a very clean industry. You probably want to make sure that those aren't um, present in the building. So I think that if you're working with a realtor um, like Skip, you know, and uh, a broker to be able to make sure that he can work on your behalf to find out if there was some environmental site assessments done and um, negotiate that into your deal that those do get done because you really want to purchase something that you're aware of what you're dealing with. And then if you have a community partner like we do with our Norwich Community um, Development Corporation, which is a nonprofit, 
and also the city, we might be able to go for grants to assist you with doing cleanup. So, and we've done that before in the city, but again, that is another time frame. So you need to know that really quickly if those issues and if you're gonna need some partnership and help for cleanup money from the state or federal government, because that's gonna take a little bit of time to submit applications during that time frame and then get answers on that. And again, it could work um, uh, very closely with the time frame of waiting for equipment anyways that you can't start up, but you really need to know that going in that you're gonna have this. And if you don't get the grants, what is your funding opportunity is gonna be to clean that up? Great. So uh, some of this has been touched on, but um, Deanna and Skip, um, what do you think some of the most common local zoning obstacles for both cultivation and retail are? They're, they're very different considerations, obviously. Cultivation is finding a large building to, to grow and, and retail is, um, is retail. It's like a, a sales site. Um, but what are the biggest um, obstacles you've seen in terms of zoning so far in your experience? Cultivation is not as difficult. It's just, it's just, Unfortunate that the industrial market is on fire for, I've never seen it like this in 30 years, where, because the Amazon effect and all these distribution, all these, <clears throat> um, you know, they're just, there's just no space in that, in that. But once you find a big building and it, it's not really that restricted. Retail wise, you, you ideally want to stand alone because, you know, they do smell. So the co tenancy, you don't want to be next to uh, Tiffany's because. There's, you know, whatever they tell you, they do smell. The weed is very pungent. And so you'd prefer a standalone. You prefer a bank site. Mm -hmm. Most banks only have about 20 parking spaces. So, you know, it's a difficult, it's kind of a unicorn. You want to find a, a standalone site that has a lot of parking. So, and, and a lot of banks have the vault, which helps them because they won't have to build the vault. Whether or not they can do a drive-through, I think is still getting through the state. And a lot of towns don't allow drive-throughs which is kind of a, <clears throat> I don't know whether they're going to get it or not get it. I don't know whether it matters, whether they drive through or not. But uh, that's that's kind of something they look for. And uh, that's it. Parking is the main thing. If you can find somewhere that's, you know, an end cap or standalone with a lot of parking, that's, that's ideal for them. <clears throat> I would say some of the obstacles are not specifically zoning, but, um, you know, it, at least in our case, I think that, um, in many smaller communities that don't have the uh, public utilities, that could be a real issue, especially if you're a producer. You want to make sure that you have that those water and sewer um, public uh, utilities available. You want to make sure that you have a really strong power grid that's going to work for you too. Um, so I, you know, uh, we're spoiled here in Norwich. We have our wonderful utility company. So I would say a local utility company. So those are communities that I think have. Um, are benefiting from having that hands-on partner um, that can make sure that you have those things available to you. Some communities don't, and I think the bigger utility companies aren't as involved in these, um, you know, uh, ground floor initiatives like we're doing here. So I think it's nice to have those partners, but I think you need to look at um, those, those kind of obstacles of where is this going to go? Is there already sewer and water there? And if you're using gas, I don't know if some are using gas, but some of those gas lines um, extensions could be costly and you need to look at those utilities. Um, also uh, looking at um, obstacles, except I think that Skip was right, parking. It's not even necessarily parking, it's the traffic again, you know, especially the retail locations. Where is this gonna be? Is it appropriate? It's gonna be something you're gonna get a lot of complaints about. So I would definitely look at locations that are already um, big ones that people are, are, are used to seeing heavy commercial activity at. And again, someplace that you would expect to find a liquor store for a retail location. Um, similar, similar to that. But as far as obstacles, I think you might find obstacles in other communities, which are that they're just not um, at this point ready to, to dive in um, with or, or jump in with both feet into this industry. So I think they're waiting on the sidelines to see how it goes in other communities. So you're going to have obstacles with them until they see that it works and that um, that it hasn't been a detriment to other communities. So they're on a wait and see. So those are some obstacles just because you're not going to have the buy-in from every community that you may be interested in, in being located. And not to be a Debbie Downer and pile on the obstacles, but uh, as I'm just scribbling as I'm thinking. Security is a, is, a, is a big question I get from a lot of landlords who are hesitant is what's the security because of the cash. The government doesn't acknowledge this. So it has to be all cash. So if you've got a waiting line outside a store with 30 people in it, obviously there's a security issue because they've all got cash on them. So you want a place that's big enough that they can kind of queue the line inside a store and have a security guard. And, uh, and banking is, is, is another issue because, because 
if there's mortgages involved and there's very particular type of landlord who's one, you know, morally cool with the use and two, that his bank is going to let, let him have this use within the building and the co-tenancy. I got shot down by Walmart. I got shot down by, by uh, Walgreens, uh, Bank of America, a bunch of, bunch of, you know, powerful tenants said to the landlord when we got down to the ninth inning, that no, you can't, you know, I, I have a restrictive use clause and you're not allowed, you know, this falls within that, uh, within that category, even though sometimes it's not written as a can recreational cannabis store, they'll say that they had something against paraphernalia and they'll call it a, they'll call it a pot store, you know, and, and then they are, you know, it's not worth getting into the argument because you're going to lose anyway. I think it's not worth hiring the, the legal fee, but <clears throat> those, there's a lot of obstacles. There's no doubt about it. So Skip, you mentioned the um, landlords. Tell me a little bit about the landlords. How have they been in this process? This is a new world, as you mentioned. They've got financing and banking considerations. Um, obviously, all the other uh, you know, considerations as well, security, how, how other tenants react. Are they giving um, applicants enough time to go through this process? You know, Deanna mentioned it's a multi-month process to get the permits approved. Are they, you know, are they being reasonable? Are they being unreasonable? Are they asking new businesses to put money up in front of uh, getting approved? H how's that process with the landlords and the relationship there been in your experience so far? All over the place. I think the landlords, you know, like I said, smell blood in the water. They know there's, there's, there's a need for sites and they've been pigeonholed into these areas. So some of them have gouged these tenants and asked for them to start paying rent, you know, immediately some of them paying expenses immediately some of them are getting typical market free rent but not many and then they have all these feasibility periods so the kind of lease goes hard at you know say on typical four or five months of of free rent and then it goes hard and they you know then you have the tenant will request the option to terminate and get out if they don't get approval obviously but the landlord's going to want you to pay full rent at some point in that stream and that's that's uh, that's a, that's difficult for for the tenant and i think it's difficult on the the local kind of person that gets gets qualified who's up against you know a company that's you know a couple of these companies are worth billions of dollars and they can afford to pay the rent and, and if you and i go and open a store we can't pay a year's worth of rent when not knowing that we're going to get approved so i think it puts the bigger companies in a better in a smaller companies in a disadvantage um, I, I concur with what Skip is saying, and I think that one advice that I would give to anyone looking for real estate, if you're not working with a, a, a broker, someone that's professional that knows um, what they're doing as far as dealing with these owners, there's a lot of property owners that um, I like to affectionately call property hoarders, which are, they, they love their properties, they really have no intention to do anything with them, and you know, a lot of these properties are underutilized, they're sitting there vacant, but they're kind of just waiting to see what happens in the market or what happens. I don't know, they, they love their properties. They don't necessarily have to sell them or wanna sell them. So when they're approached because it, they meet the requirements of someone who wants to say do a production facility, um, there's not a lot of incentive um, for them to sell and they don't, they kind of make it difficult. So I, my first advice would be, if you start seeing that they're dragging their feet right from the beginning and they're not committing or they're not, you need to jump off and you need to go somewhere else because I, you know, we've worked with someone here and spent months and months trying to uh, make a deal on a particular property. And, um, you know, to be honest with you, had they asked me right up front, you know, confidentially, I would have said, you know, this is a property hoarder. This is a guy who has had so many opportunities to develop this site and people coming forward to buy it or lease it. And he doesn't, and he's wasted people's time before. And I hate to see that happen. Um, but I don't always know that they're working behind the scenes with these people and months go by and they're like, you know, is this guy a problem? And you're like, yeah, it kind of is, you know, so, um, you know, so I just, I'd say that that's one of the obstacles really is, is, um, is sometimes those property owners are just not willing to work for, like Skip is saying, buildings that people bought for a couple hundred thousand dollars, you know, within the last year or two. Now they're wanting millions of dollars for these same buildings without improvements. They just all of a sudden, you know, I know the real estate market is hot, but it's super hot when they know that it's a potential cannabis facility um, and they're just seeing dollar signs. And, and I think it's horrible, to be honest with you. It's very frustrating for the community because we want to see these things happen. And if they can't find it, you know, a site that's a, at a price that's reasonable or at least workable, 
um, it's hurting everybody. You know, it's really not, doesn't allow it to happen in the community. So um, most municipalities don't own buildings that they can just turn over for this use. So they're really um, relying on the private sector who has these commercial properties to, you know, to move forward and, and to work with the interested parties. Retail, I don't think has been so bad because there is a lot of freestanding retail buildings um, and Skip's idea with the bank. I think that we, we've mentioned that multiple times as well. Um, that's a really good uh, type of a reuse of a, a retail a bank. A lot of them are um, just doing drive ups now in ATMs, so banks are, are closing. So there's opportunities for that, but um, just don't waste your time. So those obstacles are really, um, unfortunately, they could be the people who are either looking to rent or to sell their buildings. What we do here in Norwich, I just want to add this on, is that if you find a property and that you're working a deal, we'll write you a letter for your application that says um, that this particular site is allowed for that use and what the process would be, whether it's a zoning permit, special permit. So you can submit that to the state with your with your application. Um, we're not asking that you have a you know a signed agreement, but just you know something that we can say, hey, this this is good to go if you if you're going to get this site. Um, and we'll do, you know, multiples of those letters if there's multiple properties, you know, so just to make sure that, you know, they have choices to deal with and they'll know right up front what the process is going to be. And then when they, if they get selected for a license, we'll walk them through that, uh, that process to get approved. Great. Wow. So a pro, a pro, a pro business a zoning person. I love, I love it. Can we clone you? <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're lucky we have a great team here in Norwich. Um, and, uh, you know, what we do is if, a, if one of these, like, same thing, if, if anyone's interested in a particular building and they want to go in it with a commercial real estate agent um, and they want our opinion on I can get the team of our fire marshal, building officials, our zoning agent, our city engineer, our the health department, if they need the health department out there, and our economic development people, we meet regularly out on site. Um, and we were all there to give our comments to you at one time. Um, and do a pretty quick overview of you know what we see right away that might be challenging on a particular site and um, so you walk away getting a lot of uh, information really quickly and not having to you know chase down different people in different departments we our development team um, is a one-stop shop and we come out to the site with you if you're interested right. you have to ask. so before before uh, before skip and I get in a car and hop up to, to Norwich um, uh, I just wanted to ask a few questions on the construction side because, you know, equally as important as once I get my permits approved, I find the ideal property um, is, you know, what's a good way to vet a contractor, a construction contractor? Any, any advice, Mark? So first off, I'd probably make sure the contractor has experience in building a similar type building or renovating that type of building. Um, and then also making sure that the subcontractors that they're planning on using are legitimate subcontractors and they're using their own employees. Right now, there is a, a material shortage, labor shortage, everyone's heard of, like I was referring to earlier about switch gears, 18 months, uh, drywall is going up. Uh, there's also dense glass shortage, which is the exterior uh, type of drywall that you put on the exterior of a building. All those things come into account. So what ends up happening is sometimes our larger contractors that might be come off with a larger number, they have a better grasp on the market. They also have better buying power. So they're actually going to, in the long run, be providing you a better product. So sometimes it's more important to vet the contractors, look at them in totality, instead of just looking at a number on a page. Because as we're talking about this with the, you know, bringing all these experts on, buying the property that the price is going up because of what it is and where it is, everything, it's just dollar signs, dollar signs, dollar signs. A lot of times um, people end up looking at construction as an opportunity. Okay, now here's where I can cut corners, but it's actually one of the worst places to cut corners because you know, in the words of Benjamin Franklin, the bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of low price is forgotten. So when you're looking at a project and you're like, oh, well, I'm just gonna go ahead and go over here because it's the lowest price. There's a reason why it's the lowest price. It doesn't matter whether you're using union or non-union labor. Um, Certainly not talking about that aspect of it, but it just comes down to the price of material. And when you're a larger contractor, you're able to purchase in larger volumes. So you get the best price for equipment, you get the best price for products. Uh, with that being said, any project that is over $5 million requires a, a, a labor harmony agreement. And you know the- Yeah, I was just gonna ask you, cause you mentioned the difference between union labor and non-union labor. And I know, um, I just wanted to mention two provisions in the state law. One, um, in order to put in your application, you don't actually need site control. You need site control in place uh, in order to receive a license. 
Um, and so you do need it obviously at some point in the game, but you don't need it to put your application in and to get moving. Um, the other provision in the law that, that Mark's talking about is a provision that refers to projects over $5 million. And there's something called the Project Labor Agreement, a PLA. And I wanted you to tell us a little bit more about what that is, Mark. What is a PLA? Um, what does it mean? And um, what does it mean for my project that it is uh, going to be a Project Labor Agreement project? So Project Labor Agreements is basically, it's an agreement that the building trades come together with the owner, developer, construction manager, and come to a term a set of agreement prior to the project starting to make sure that the project is, if it's in the city of Norwich, that we hire people from the city of Norwich that work on the project, it, that there's a certain number of minorities, apprentices, veterans. It establishes all these guidelines to a project before we even get one foot or one construction uh, a worker on site. One of the things that it does as well is that it makes sure that the job doesn't stop. Um, for any reason whatsoever, uh, and it provides channels for people to come get hired. As I was referring to earlier, the labor shortage, um, one of the benefits of using unionized labor is that we have a very deep pool of app uh, applicants and uh, tradespeople. So it doesn't matter if it's electricians or plumbers or carpenters or iron workers, um, all of us have a, an industry in the industry are out there constantly recruiting, uh, going to job fairs, but also bringing people into our trade and then training them at a training center. So you're getting the best quality uh, trades people on your project. It's, some people feel like it might be a little bit of a hamstring to them uh, to have this requirement on the, on the projects. And I'll be honest, it's actually going to end up helping them in the long run. And I'm not just saying that from where I'm sitting, I'm saying that because uh, I watch a lot of projects get delayed because um, ABC Mechanical can't afford to buy the materials until you give them money up front, or the drywall contractor doesn't have enough volume doing with Camco where they're going to be able to get that delivery when they need it and bump other people. Uh, you take some of our larger drywall contractors are doing $40, $50 million a year in, in volume. They're going to have no problem having the, the company drop off materials or bump other people and provide the materials, especially metal studs, drywall, dense glass, fiberglass. Um, roofing materials, there's all these things there's uh, a shortage on. And uh, as we know, uh, money talks and people that are doing large volume is going to get the product before the uh, small shop is going to get it. And just the way that the industry is working right now. So if you do have a project that's over the $5 million mark, uh, there's a group of us that you would sit down and talk down, talk with, and we would just uh, put together the set of rules for the project. You'll understand, know the holidays. They'll, everyone will know everything going into it, and then the project will go forward. There won't be any interruptions. There won't be any stoppages, and there'll be a direct pathway for everyone that needs to get on the job. So if we need to hire people, we'll have different uh, routes with the cities that are, they're in. And using the city of Norwich, once again, we'll have a requirement probably for people that live in the city to work on the project. Because one of our goals with these project labor agreements is to train the next generation of tradespeople. So we're not in the situation we're in kind of right now where there's a lack of people in the industry. So we're trying to train as many people and encourage them to join. Uh, hopefully Sounds that like kind of explained it, but. Yeah, no, that's great. I think it sounds to me like a great way to kind of address some of these labor constraints um, and supply side constraints um, that we've talked about today. Um, this has been a great conversation. We've covered a lot of ground here. Um, this you know, new industry in our state represents an enormous opportunity um, for new businesses. And uh, we've highlighted, I think, a, a number of obstacles um, and um, given people some great tools and advice to use. I'll give everyone one final opportunity. I just want to go around the horn, uh, maybe starting with Deanna um, and then going to Skip, just to see, is there one sort of final piece of advice that you can give a new business um, or existing business who's expanding um, to help them navigate through all of these obstacles and challenges with respect to real estate and construction and uh, finding the right site um, and navigating the relationship with the municipality that you have? I would say to find out who the key figures are in the community that you're working in as far as the municipal officials and um, know who they are and speak with them and uh, get them on board and then ask for their assistance. So they're, you know, people in the communities, we know best of what sites are where and, and uh, you know, where it may work and where we think it would be a problem because we know of historically maybe there was some other issues on that site that neighbors were having problems with. So, you know, use the resources that are available to you. It costs you nothing. We're here. Um, and again, we have resources in our community where we'll come out and look at the properties with you, you know, before you commit and sign, you know, the dotted line to buying a property and not knowing much about it, 
get us out there. It's cost you nothing, excuse me. I apologize, thank you. Um, uh, it costs you nothing to, um, to be able to just reach out to us and we'll help in any way possible because it's a win-win for you and a win-win for the community if we can um, you know, assist you and have you here as a tax paying business in our community and a municipal user of our utilities. So um, yeah, we, we're, we're welcoming in our community. And, and so if you happen to come to Norwich, you can de definitely reach out to, to me, Deanna Rhodes, or you can speak with Kevin Brown, who is the president of Norwich Community Development Corporation and um, or anyone else on our team. So we're, we're here Great. to help. Thanks, Deanna. Skip. I'm doing my next deal in Norwich. Good. <laughs> Welcome. Any parting and advice? I would say hire a good professional, a good real estate broker. Make sure they do it primarily retail because not just definitely not a residential broker, not just a commercial mm -hmm. broker. Make sure they, they most of the time is spent doing retail because it's a, it's a different business than residential or definitely than the guys that are finding guys and girls that are finding office space. And uh and that's it. Like, watch out for the greedy landlords. Move, I think Deanna gave good advice. Move on from the greedy ones. If they're, if they're impossible, they're going to stay impossible. That's great. Thanks, Skip. Mark? I would say interview and uh, <clears throat> interview your general contractors and make sure that they have experience in building something similar or uh, has the same uh, effects. If you, you know, you can feel free to re reach out to me. Um, my information's out there. I don't know if Adam's gonna be putting it out, but um, feel free to reach out. I can direct you to general contractors that are commercial general contractors. This is commercial work. You don't wanna be using a, a residential contractor for any of this stuff, even if it's just a retail fit up. Um, the security uh, that's required in, inside is not uh, something that a residential contractor for electrical or or even a residential framing uh, uh, carpentry contractor is going to be able to do so feel free to reach out we'll direct you to the best general contractors that we know um, and that will be able to help you get your project up and running as fast as possible Deanna Road, city of Norwich, uh, Skip, uh, Skip Lane from Cushman and Wakefield and Mark Oaken from the Carpenters um, Union. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your advice, for your time, um, for your patience. Um, we look forward to hearing more from you um, about your successes and, and uh, staying in touch. And I'll make sure everyone listening in today has your contact information. Thank you so much. Perfect, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thanks. Bye all.